All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Conflict Management and Depolarization Seminar at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, being sponsored by the Center for Public Leadership and the Management, Leadership, and Decision Science area. Um, my name is Julia Minton, and I am very excited to host our speaker today. Uh, he is Professor Eli Finkel from Northwestern. Uh, Eli is uh, jointly appointed between the psychology department uh, and uh, the Kellogg uh, School of Management. Uh, and he will talk to us today about the state of polarization in America. Uh, welcome, Eli, and please take it away. I am totally delighted with that introduction. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I am excited to share ideas that are new for me. I was historically, a, a, and I still am, a relationships researcher. I study online dating and speed dating and how people stay passionate in their marriage over time, like those sorts of questions. And just in the last two, three years, I've really gotten interested in um, issues surrounding political polarization. So I'll share my screen. Um, can I get a thumbs up, uh, Julia? Can you? Okay, you guys can see it. And let me just say, I can see you guys because I've got this screen down here. So um, you're not obligated to turn your your uh, video on, but I always like seeing faces. So if you're inclined to do that, I, I would love to see you guys. Um, okay, so I, uh, in principle, I'm working on a book. In practice, I've been backburnering it for a while, but the book is predicated on trying to think about uh, the situation we have in US politics, broadly speaking. Um, from the perspective of a relationship scientist or a relationship psychologist. And broadly, the, the, the key insight I had that made me think that that might be a, a fun book to write is I started to think like relationship psychology has been a discipline that's around for, I don't know, call it 75 years. And like all these disciplines that have been around for a while, there's like a bunch of stuff you know, and then a bunch of stuff you think you may know. But if you take the like foundational things that are just true about relationships, just the empirical facts at this point, for example, treating your spouse with contempt is associated with bad relationship outcomes. Uh, when you get the opportunity to interpret an ambiguous thing that your partner did, if you interpreted it, if you interpret it in the most malevolent way possible, like she did that thing because she hates your guts and wants to destroy you and make you miserable, um, these are things that you would do if you wanted to build the worst relationship you can imagine. If you take those things, I just give you a couple examples, and you superimpose them on the body politic, I think we've built it. I think basically we have done the equivalent of a, of a lab built most toxic marriage possible when it comes to our political discourse these days. So I'm not presenting on that. I'm presenting on like a, a much smaller part of what is becoming a, a somewhat complex argument. Um, and in particular, I, I'm excited to run by you, this particular group, some of the ideas I'm playing with, this idea of, of fighting phantoms and disagreement versus disdain in the body politic you'll see I'm kind of going to build to a, a case, an argument, that um, the amount of disagreement we have is actually not very much. Uh, and the amount of disdain we have is like heroically huge. And talk a little bit about the disconnect between those two things and, and what I think it means for the, the state of our society and maybe trying to make it a little better. OK, um, the only time I will talk about the relationship stuff is right here. So this is my book. I have to show it to you because my publisher requires it. And um, I don't have a URL to buy 20 copies, but each of you should. But I, I bring this up because some of the thinking that I did for this book, I, I think, translates pretty well, and not just the relationship psychology parts. But, but let me show you this. So, so when I was writing this book, I was eating lunch one day, and I got this tweet. This is from the Gottman Institute. Some of you may know that John Gottman's like a legend in the field of relationship psychology. And this is the tweet. Couples who are demanding of their marriage are more likely to have deeply satisfying unions than those who lower their expectations. So you, you really should make sure that you have reasonably high expectations of your, of your relationship, of your marriage, because that's the way to have a good relationship. Literally minutes later, I'm eating lunch while taking a break from writing the book, Esther Perel, again, a name that some of you may know, like a true guru in terms of thinking about relationships. I, admi I admire both of these, uh, John Gottman and Esther Perel, a huge amount. She says, expectations are resentments waiting to happen. And I find this interesting that like, well, here I am and some, you know, day in May 2016. And it's like, well, you definitely want to have high expectations and you seem to want to have low expectations. And the, the book, to a large extent, is playing with this. Like, it's like, well, you know, what are the consequences? When do you want high expectations? And, and to oversimplify a significant amount, my general take on these two tweets and in the book in general is we can ask whatever we want from our marriage, but there are consequences of those asks. Right. Like if you want your 
spouse to be your best friend. I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't ask for that, but there are things that we try to do if we're trying to maintain a best friendship. You want lifelong monogamy? There are things that you might need to do if you want to try to make sure that that works, right? Just make sure that, that you're calibrating your asks to the level of compatibility and the amount of investment you're and the sorts of investments you're willing to make. I'm going to come back to that idea in a second, but I'll pivot here to democracy in the US. And in particular, I, I want to pivot back to something I, I mentioned this in the abstract I sent you guys. But, but in general, I'm, I'm pretty interested in this moment in history. I think the general gist of this story is true, even though the details are fuzzy. But shortly after the, the um, Constitutional Convention in 1787, Philadelphia lady Elizabeth Willing Powell says, what have we got, doctor, a republic or a monarchy? Right? It was not clear what was going to come out of that Constitutional Convention. And Franklin famously says, a republic, if you can keep it. And I, I have found this to be an increasingly interesting thing to say as I think more about it. Like, what did he mean? What does it mean to say, if you can keep it? Like you, the individual citizen, keep the republic? Like, what does it mean? And, and so my take on that, and this is um, reminiscent of what I said a couple slides ago, is that we can ask whatever we want of our political system, but there are consequences of those asks. Right, so if you want to have a republic, which has a lot of nice elements, it's nice to be in a republic rather than a monarchy in many ways, um, you can do that, but there now becomes a lot of responsibility that, that resides at the feet of the individual citizens and the, the public collectively. So the question is, what can individual citizens do to build and sustain a political system that Lincoln later characterized as a government of, by, and for the people? Now, there are lots of potential answers to this question. I'm not going to have the time today to list a bunch of them and go through the pros and cons, but I do want to mention one that I find particularly intriguing, which came from George Washington's farewell address. Yes, this is the address that was popularized in, uh, repopularized in the musical Hamilton. But he gives an answer. He basically says, avoid extreme partisanship. They often talked in terms of factions, but, but basically saying avoid extreme partisanship. He gives a bunch of, of um, reasons why you should do this. I'll just highlight some of them here so you can see that the first one is extreme partisanship. Always, uh, it serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. Basically means government ceases to be able to function. I think that's a reasonable prediction um, that he made about what the consequences will be. Uh, in yellow here, we have another one. Uh, extreme partisanship kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasional riot and insurrection. Here, he was looking at his, at his glass ball, I think, when he made this uh, prediction. And then third here in green, he says, you know, it opens the door to foreign influence and corruption, which finds a facilitated access to the government th itself through the channels of party passions. Here again, I think he was looking at a crystal ball for this stuff. So this is one answer of like, you know, how do you keep the republic is you try to avoid um, extreme partisanship. They also talked, the founders in general talked about how extreme partisanship can uh, yield uh, the, the ascent of demagogues. Well, at that time, uh, Washington was just speculating. There was no political science. There weren't even really social sciences in the modern sense of the word. So it's interesting to consider, like, what is the evidence in support of the claims that, that uh, George Washington made in 1796? And we now have what I perceive to be a reasonable uh, body of evidence testing some version of that idea that like extreme factionalism, extreme partisanship uh, tends to be bad for republics, for democracies and so forth. And, and your colleagues, uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt have written this book. If you have not read it, I recommend it very highly. It is an alarming and compelling book um, where they review the evidence, like how, demo how do democracies die? They say, we have this vision in our heads of, of military coups. Uh, for example, Pinochet's coup in 1973, there's the presidential palace that is on fire. They say, like, this is not mostly the way democracies die. Not lately, not in recent decades. Mostly democracies don't die because of some military coup. They die because somebody working within the system slowly erodes uh, the, the norms that are required to sustain democracy, and that over time, democracy tends to evaporate or disappear rather than having some sort of huge military uh, eruption that kills it. And they argue in this book, uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt do, that there are two key democratic norms that we need to follow. And once we stop following these, democracy is, in, is under risk, is under threat. First is mutual toleration, where you view opposing partisans as legitimate opposition rather than as ex existential enemies. And the second is forbearance, where you adopt the view that just because you have the power to do something doesn't mean that you should. Now here it's as good a time as any to say that there exists no constitution, no set of laws in principle that can come up with every piece of chicanery that people might try to use to manipulate the system to political advantage, right? And so they argue that these norms are crucial and that forbearance is one of the key elements, right? So 
should you pack the court? Should you gerrymander? Should you filibuster? Should you engage in corrupt pardons? You can do it. It's not against the law to do these things. It's not unconstitutional to do these things. But once you start doing these things, you are, in the argument of this book, on the road toward democratic erosion. Uh, let me stop here for a moment and say I'm delighted to be uh, interrupted. If you guys have questions or comments, uh, raise your hands this way, you know, the physical hands or the digital hands. I'll try to see you, but Julia also is monitoring this. So I, I welcome um, interruptions along the way. Washington said something else in his address, right? He said something that, that, that's relevant to us. So in addition to his concerns about factionalism, he's specific about how we should avoid it. He says, and there being constant danger of excess from factionalism, the effort ought to be by force of public opinion to mitigate and assuage it, extreme partisanship, a fire not to be quenched, it demands a uniform vigilance to prevent its bursting into a flame lest instead of warming it should consume. So he says something interesting here. How is it that we should, you know, to, to paraphrase uh, Franklin, how should we keep the Republic by force of public opinion resisting the urges to be strongly factional because we will have those urges because we are factional beings we need to fight against them at the level of the individual the public opinion the collection of individuals so let me just summarize this this first sort of entree part of the talk which is um, first, living in a republic comes with responsibility. Second, one responsibility is adherence to an enforcement of toleration and forbearance, not only when we see the other side violating these norms, but also when we ourselves or the people on our side tend to, uh, are inclined to, or are in the midst of violating these norms. And that ultimate responsibility for upholding these norms resides with we the people, that we in this particular uh, political system, the buck stops with us. Okay, we'll consider alternatives to this ultimate responsibility claim later, like maybe if he was around today, Franklin would have said, uh, yes, it's a republic if Facebook stops doing what it does or something. I'll come back to those other sorts of, of explanations beyond this we the people explanation. Okay, all of this is, is sort of backdrop to, well, what is the state of our nation, right? Like, are we as divided as it sometimes feels like we are? Well, it turns out that there's two, again, this group probably is familiar with this work, two broad ways of answering this question. One is, how much do we disagree, like in terms of, of ideology or political ideas or political policy preferences, like to what degree is there a substantial difference in these things? And the second type is, to what degree do we dislike the people on the other side, right? So, so I want to make a distinction here between polarization on ideas and polarization on, on groups or people. So ideological polarization here too, there's a couple ways that you can assess this. So you can break it down a couple of different ways. Um, one way that that um, political scientists have assessed this stuff is in the form of consistency, most associated with Abramowitz. One is uh, divergence, which is most associated with Fiorina. So, so let's talk first about consistency. The, these are graphs from the Pew Research Center. A lot of you have seen these graphs. They're pretty disconcerting, right? Like you start in 1994, which those of us who are old enough to remember was like the Gingrich Revolution, hardly a time of partisan comity. And yet there's this drastic moving such that the Republicans have moved to the right and the Democrats have moved to the left. But what is consistency? It basically says, if you adopt the left of center position on one topic, say the environment, do you also adopt the left of center position on some other uh, topic, say, taxation, right? And so basically what this shows is that we are indeed becoming more internally coherent, what political scientists talk as more constrained, right? That is, if you're a lefty on one thing, you're a lefty on all the things to a greater extent than we were a couple of decades ago. But that's not, I think, what most people mean by polarization. I think what people mean by polarization is that like the left is getting further to the left on the issues and the right in the ideologies and issues, and the right is getting further to the right. And here you see very little evidence. So, so this top graph, is people who identify as uh, liberal, moderate, or, or conservative over time. There's just not much meaningful stuff happening over the last few decades. And here you have this idea of a bimodality threshold. Like, is it true that you've got like a bunch of people over here on one side and then flat in the middle and a bunch of people on the other side? There's like no evidence for that. And there's no evidence really for any sort of increasing tendency like that. Um, so in brief, it looks like we're sort of more internally consistent. Like we get the memo, if we're a lefty, we're supposed to have this set of positions. If we're a righty, we're supposed to have this set of positions, but we um, haven't become more extreme in our, in our ideologies or um, yeah, in our broad ideologies since then. Now, let me, I don't know, is, is Mike Norton, are you on this call? Oh yeah, Julia, go ahead. I have a clarifying question. So if you look at the consistency figures, uh, they do, I can't, I can't quite read the x-axis, but it does look like the distribution yes. is moving further apart. They definitely so have. Something is getting further apart from something. Yes. Uh, so, so specifically what's getting further apart is if you are to the left of the midpoint on issue one, 
can we tell that you are likely to be left of the midpoint on issues two, three, four, five, six, and seven? And the answer is yes. That is, that is if you are have this opinion on abortion. Now, by the way, it's worth all of us thinking about, is there really a coherent ideology behind why somebody would have the left position on abortion and environment and tax policy? I mean, maybe, maybe you need to build a pretty complex form of ideology. Um, like, you know, Julia, you were saying earlier, like, why is it that that the, the Democrats were the ones who were very concerned about COVID, right? Like, isn't that supposed to be the Republicans who are sort of more anxious and fearful, right? Like, th there's a lot of um, asymmetry. But yes, there is a meaningful rise in consistency over time. That is, if we're lefty on one thing, we're lefty on all the things relative to in the past. We are not more extreme on a dimension from like way left to way right. We have not gotten more, more extreme. Does that make sense? Thank okay. You. Now, wait, is Norton on the call? Are you here, Mike? Because this is, uh, he claims that, that I'm the only person that's read this paper. So, so this is a, a great paper from Jimena and Mike from last year. This paper um, looks at the percent of respondents who state that each issue is morally acceptable. These are big nationally representative samples from up to 39 different nations who report on abortion, alcohol use, contraception, divorce, just a bunch of issues that arguably are moral issues. And, and there are three response options, uh, not a moral issue, morally unacceptable or morally acceptable. What they do in this paper that I find very interesting is they compare US Republicans and US Democrats, again, those are the red and the blue bars here, um, how far apart are they within the context of how far, how, what is the range of views, the range of moralization of these issues across the 39 nations that they had to study? So some version of across the globe, right? And what you can see is, um, more than 70% of the cross-national comparisons across these eight issues are, uh, let me say this differently. We are more similar, Democrats and Republicans, if you take the people who are reporting on this, are more similar than 70% of any possible cross-national, uh, binational comparisons. Um, is that a lot or a little? Nobody knows. I, I don't think even theorists have started to engage with like, what is the optimal level of difference? Or is this a large or a small amount of difference? But you can see that within the spectrum of beliefs that humans have put together on this globe, Democrats and Republicans are a whole lot more similar than many nations are from one another. Okay, that's all I wanna say about ideas and ideals. Like that's what we know about um, ideological polarization over time and, and degree of agreement on moral issues. What about this second thing, which I'm calling, you know, my colleagues and I call political sectarianism. Sometimes there's a version of it called affective polarization or social polarization. This is like, do you dislike the people? And we uh, published a piece uh, last year um, called Political Sectarianism in America. This is a piece that was on the shelf when uh, on election day last year, um, a group of like 15 scholars from six different social science disciplines trying to do something like, like a consensus statement. Like what is it that we think we know about the state of political polarization? And we talked a lot about this social aspect. And we said that this it consists of a poisonous cocktail of othering, that is us versus them, aversion that is not just different from me, but dislikable and not just dislikable in any way, dislikable and evil or bad, right? It's this cocktail that seems to be especially prevalent and perhaps especially troubling. So negative partisanship is, is a, a term that political scientists have been using to talk about what's been changing in uh, one of the things that's been changing in the US political system over time. And uh, the idea is that we are increasingly influenced by hatred for the other side, right? You're witnessing these days how difficult it is for Democrats to agree on like a spending plan, but they certainly agree that Donald Trump is evil, right? And so it's, it's a lot easier to get each side to hate the other side than to support its own side. But if you look, you can just look at, at these feeling thermometer ratings. Again, zero is I feel very coldly, 100 is I feel very warmly. To what degree do we feel warmly versus coldly about our own party? Basically no change. That's, an, that's one of the reasons why I don't really like talking about rising polarization because polarization is a different score. And it sort of implies like we, we like our in-group a whole lot more and our out-group a whole lot less. It's not really what's happening. We like our in-group somewhere between, I don't know, 72 and 74 degrees, basically since the beginning of these big nationally representative surveys. What has changed is how much we dislike the other side. It was like almost 50, you know, in the late 1970s, call it a tepid 50. And now it's getting to a frosty 2025, right? And, and one thing that we did in our paper is you can actually like consider 
if this is the, the, it's identified as a neutral point, how much more do we like our own side relative to neutral versus dislike the other side relative to neutral? And you start to see something interesting here. That is for a while there in the seventies and the eighties, we had a strong preference for our in-group over our out-group because we didn't dislike the out-group very much. Then there was this period in the nineties and two thousands that was sort of in the middle. And then over the last decade, we're underwater. That is, we've started to hate the other side so much that we hate them more than we actually like our, our own in-group. And this is related to this idea of, of negative partisanship. And because we're increasingly influenced by hatred for the other side in terms of our voting behavior and, and basically our political orientation more generally, we can look at something interesting. So, so you've seen this rise of extreme partisan loyalty. Um, so this is a Abramowitz and Webster 2016 study. What you see here on, on the y-axis is a correlation. And in particular, what this is, is this is the correlation between the Democratic share of the House vote and the Democratic share of the presidential vote in contested elections. Now, you surely would always expect those to be positive, right? Like if you wanted the Democrat in the House, you wanted the Democrat in the, in the presidency, no problem. But it used to be that there would be a politician that you would like or dislike, or there would be local issues that would be important enough to you that you would vote for the Democrat for, for House, but the Republican for president or something like that. Those days are basically gone. Basically, again, this was only the early, this is a 2016 study. It goes to the early part of the last decade, but a correlation of 0.94, when the highest you could possibly get is 0.99, is pretty vast. And it basically says, you know what we do? We vote for the letter. Is there a D or an R next to this thing? That seems to be almost sufficient to determine all of our voting tendencies and the individual politician, the individual issues at play. Those seem to be largely irrelevant these days. Not true 30, 40 years ago, true today. This is Trump. So what I've done here on the X axis is I plotted county from like the, the most Clinton focused, the most Clinton voting to the most Trump voting counties. This is 2016. There's over 3,100 of these counties. And what you can see is that, you know, there's like a big range in the, in the electorate. Now, one of the things I find interesting is, is if you pay as much attention to politics as I do, you've read a lot of stuff about all the interesting ways that 2020 was distinctive, like all the different ways. So, so this is a 538 article, how the 2020 election changed the electoral map or lots of discussion about, you know, Cuban Americans shifting in Florida shifting toward Trump in, to, in a double digit sort of way. So, so let me ask you, if you had to guess, I don't know if we have time for this, but just in your head, if you had to guess, like, what do you think the correlation is, right? So Trump's vote share of the two party vote in 2016 versus 2020, would you guess it's like 0.5? That would be a reasonable correlation, but probably higher than that, 0.75, 0.9? 0.95, like what do you think it would be? Well, let me just give you the answer here, right? So these are the actual, um, actual data and the correlation is 0.99. What that means is that despite the impeachment, despite COVID, despite George Floyd, like I can go down the list of all, despite Russiagate, right? I can go down the list of all this stuff. And yet between 2016 and 2020, if you knew the proportion of the vote share in a given county that Trump had in 2016, you know almost every single thing you need to know to predict the proportion of the vote share that he would have in 2020. Now, there was better turnout in 2020, I think partly because it felt like such an existential threat, partly because of mail-in voting, but, but basically counties, there was like almost, little, almost literally no difference, 0.99 correlation. So let me sum up this second part. So there really isn't much of an increase in ideological divergence, that it, it, it isn't the case that in general, lefties have gone further to the left and righties have gone further to the right. Um, when you look cross nationally, there don't appear to be particularly large differences on a lot of these moral issues. Um, there are large increases in political sectarianism, that is hatred for the other side and negative partisanship. Um, and it seems to be that we have arrived at a moment of party uber alles, that is, Pretty much you just need to know if there's a D or an R next to the name, and that seems to be sufficient to figure out whom you're gonna vote for and you know, in general, your political orientation, your, your, your approach to politics. Uh-oh, Hannah, go ahead. Hi, so um, how do we think about, so I, I'm, I, I, I don't disbelieve what you're saying for people who belong to the parties. But even we had, for instance, uh, uh, just visiting this week, the former governor of Massachusetts. Massachusetts is a pretty blue state, right? But he was noting that there are actually more independents in Massachusetts um, than there are like registered Democrats and Republicans combined. And so how do we think about that? Like, I, I just, I'm just trying to get my head around. Are you thinking about people who are party members? Are you thinking about 
Like, how, how do we think about people who are independent or not identified? Is that part of your picture? I'm sure there are people in this call that are more knowledgeable about independent politics than I am. Let me give my best crack at that. Again, I'm, for all this stuff, I'm so new that I'm like hanging on by my fingernails in terms of these things. My understanding is that the vast majority of people who identify as independent actually are leaners um, and that they are under most circumstances um, undifferentiable from their like from true partisans right that they, they they want to say they're independent but when push comes to shove there's not much difference in terms of things like how much they hate the other side and so forth um, my understanding is that true independence might be fewer than 10 percent of the population and i just don't know enough to comment knowledgeably about what to make of them um i will say like some of those data i was showing were, were sort of sort of collapsed across independence right so for example what percentage of the vote share did trump get in 2016 versus 2020, um, if you voted for the Democratic House member, did you also vote for the Democratic president? Like those things include independent. So the, those findings collapse across the bunch. Independent um, psychology, I don't know enough about it. Does anybody want to, I mean, it's plausible to me that there are leading experts on this call. Anybody want to chime in in terms of the role of independence in this stuff? I do agree with you that a lot of what I'm going to describe probably doesn't apply to them true independence. I just don't think there are very many of them. Okay. Thank you for the question. Sorry, I don't have a more sophisticated answer. Eli, there's a question in the chat oh, that sure. I had to flag and it sort of dovetails with like the question I've been thinking about. So I'm glad it just got raised in the chat. So the yeah. question in the chat is how much do you believe is a result of political discourse or are the social media platforms more of a factor for this phenomenon? But I think it's a question about like, where do you think this stuff is coming from? Um, I'm going to come back to that um, because remember, I, I made this claim that it's like on us, it's like we the people. And then I said, you know, Franklin didn't say like, you know, if Facebook doesn't exist, right? He said, if you can keep it. Um, the, the brief answer is I think social media is, is a horror show for this and deeply, deeply exacerbating the problem. I continue to believe that that's our fault. I don't blame Zuckerberg for the fact that we love to hate the other side. If we liked other stuff, they would show us that other stuff. They just want our engagement. So we're responsible for what we engage in. I'll come back to that more. All right, so this is the, the second part. So, so now I'm getting a little bit more to um, some more psychology. So I wanna ask a question, I don't, maybe you guys talk this way. I don't hear this question asked very much, but, but really as I listen to the political discourse, I can't figure out why more of us aren't pro-violence. Um, and let me be specific here. So, so um, one argument is that lately, and this is um, this has not always been the case, that every election determines power in Washington, right? Basically every election. So let me just show you this. So this is, I plotted this from um, the last century. This is the presidential popular vote percentage. Uh, there we have Biden who won by four and a half percent. You can see it's there. And I just want to underscore a couple things about this graph. I've, I've got it coded such that red is a Republican win and blue is a, is a Democrat win. But you can look since 2000. So the 21st century, what, how many of the six elections that we've had are, are larger than 4.5 percent? One of them. It was Obama in 2000 and 2008, won by a larger amount. But let's look at the, you know, the rest of the 20th century. Again, just going back uh, another, going back a full century from where we are now, 80% of those elections, uh, I think it's like 16 of 20, are larger than the Biden percent. And of those, uh, of those 18 elections, or of that 80% of the elections that were larger than Biden's percent, the average margin of victory was 16%, a number that is almost unfathomable in the 21st century. I'd be stunned to see it anytime soon. There'd have to be a wholesale shift uh, in the nature of our politics. Like you'd think that something like, uh, you know, COVID or, or a double impeachment, I guess there was only one impeachment at the time, but you'd think those things would have those sorts of impact. Um, again, we're not seeing that stuff. And, and if you just plot the trend line, this is what you see over the last century is that there's a lot of variation. Some elections were big, some were small, but you're trending toward approximately zero, which be, basically means that every presidential election hangs in the balance, right? That, that is, power could shift easily. And, and there's a lot of research on what happens when there's unstable majorities. A lot of this is focusing on Congress. But, but basically, you stop focusing on issues, and you really try to do a bunch of votes just to make the other side look bad. Again, part of this is because we're a two-party system. I won't go too far into detail other than to say, I think a lot of the reason why the, the stakes feel so high is because legitimate power in government hinges on every election cycle in a way that didn't used to be the case. Um, my automatic blinds are closing. Give me a second.
Okay, I'm back. Um, uh, where was I? Okay, so, so that's part of it. But the other part is that the stories that we seem to believe on the left and the right are pretty horrifying about the state of our society, right? So, so this is a, a poll taken just before the uh, election last year. If the wrong candidate wins this election, America will not recover, right? This is a pretty existential story. By the way, who was among the people who pretty much thought that? I probably was. <laughs> Um, if you look at partisans, it's even uh, a larger percent. So somewhere between, uh, let's call it on average, 75% of Democrats and Republicans literally believed about 2020, if the wrong candidate wins this election, America will not recover. Those are the stakes. But those aren't the only ones. This is, um, would you say that, that, uh, the member, that the other party is a serious threat to America and its people? That's about th uh, three fifths of the people. This is again, before a lot of the stuff that really started tearing us apart. Um, in the last couple of years. This is about three fifths of partisans think this. Uh, the other side, do you think you do disagree about issues or that they are downright evil? Um, getting close to 50% of partisans think the other side is literally quote, downright evil. This is Mo Brooks on January 6th. I'm sure that a lot of you remember what Donald Trump said. I find this to be an interesting example people have paid less attention to. Imagine that you were in the audience and that you find this perspective compelling enough to be in the audience in the first place. Today, Republican senators and congressmen will either vote to turn America into a godless, amoral, dictatorial, oppressed, and socialist nation on the decline, or they will join us and they will fight and vote against voter fraud and election theft and vote for keeping America great. This is the dichotomy that I think people in that audience largely found compelling. Let me ask you, if you found that compelling, would it be that big a deal that you sort of, you know, stormed the Capitol? Seems like a reasonable thing to do if these are the stakes. Um, it's not just on the left. Um, it's not just on the right that you see this stuff. Again, I'm, I'm just picking sort of haphazardly. It's easy to find this stuff. So this is um, from Lit Hub. Rebecca Solnit, a, a, a prominent, sophisticated thinker, um, has a piece called On Not Meeting Nazis Halfway. Why is it so hard for Democrats to act like they won? This is a pretty widespread view uh, in the social media stuff that I follow and in, the, in general in the media stuff that I follow. Um, so she argues when, when, when Trump won in the 2016 election, and this is an irrelevant part of her argument, but, but um, we on the left like to highlight this while losing the popular vote, the New York Times seemed obsessed with running features about what Trump voters were feeling and thinking. These pieces, these pieces treated them, that is Trump supporters, as both an exotic species um, whoops, and people it was our job to understand, understand being that word that means both to comprehend and to grant some sort of indulgence to. And then, um, you know, she sort of delivers the coup de grace and says the appeasement didn't work in the 1930s and it won't work now. Again, she's talking here about um, the running features about Trump, Trump voters, right? So people in general, the general category here is people who voted for Trump. Um, and so they're Nazis, right? And look, I think Nazis are like bad. And if we're talking about the Third Reich, like, am I that opposed to gerrymandering commissions that, that reduce the rights of these people to, to have a proper representation? Not really. Like if that's the moral trade-off, I, I think I'm on board with it. Now here, I know that I'm going to get critiqued because it is standard and de rigueur to critique people for this. Um, I would like to be very explicit about my perspective on both sidesism. That is like where I think there's a lot of both sides, both sides are guilty and where I think there are some asymmetries. Here's my take. In America today, both sides are guilty of democracy undermining behavior, including political violence. In recent decades, Republicans have been worse. Um, and in particular, uh, Republicans have been worse in terms of gumming up the wheels of Congress and in terms of domestic terrorism. But it is ahistorical to claim that Republicans always have been worse or most likely that Republicans always will be worse. And here, let me give what I believe to be a pretty mainstream perspective on the left and ask you, are we really that opposed to violence if we think this is true? So if the truest story of America is one of grievous and ongoing racial oppression, and if the next election will determine whether the undeserving racists can destroy the vestiges of American democracy and ensure their permanent grip on their ill-gotten white supremacy, what's the problem with partisan gerrymandering and violent protests? Like if this really is the accurate story, I don't. I, it, it's not easy for me to figure out why people would object to a little bit of, of political chicanery. Wait, I see something in the chat. Let me see what this is. Um, Lons, this is kind of long. Why don't you just speak up? Helene, do you have a question you wanted to ask? Nobody wants to watch me read that. Helene, Helene? Uh, yes, um, I'll, I'll just read what I wrote. Um, 
Uh, I've been noticing, uh, you know, campaigning is hot and heavy in uh, my local town, which is a red town in blue Connecticut. Yeah. And I've uh, been taken aback uh, by the fact that lawn signs and I, I get campaign emails uh, for the local candidates um, omit any reference to the candidate's party. Um, and in fact, it's kind of confusing because blue seems to be a, a very uh, popular sign color for both parties. Sometimes someone that I know to have a uh, Republican allegiance has a thin red line in a blue sign. Um, but my question is, what's going on here? Do you have any insight into why uh, candidates seem to want to keep us voters guessing what part they belong I, to? I could definitely speculate, but I would just be speculating. Um, you know, both parties tend to have low approval ratings. I, I could come up with guesses. Uh, you know, if you want to appeal to independence, maybe you don't want to highlight your partisanship, but I would just be guessing. It, I agree with you. It's fascinating and kind of a surprising phenomenon. Um, okay, so uh, back here. So let me just summarize this third part, and then we'll get to, I think, my favorite part. So why not violence, right? Like, I, I, I don't hear this question asked. I hear a lot of people expressing horror at political violence. I feel it too or anti-democratic tendencies, I feel it too. I just don't understand how we can simultaneously believe that power rests in this next election, which is true, and the stories that we're telling ourselves, which certainly have a lot of truth in them, if we believe them to be largely the whole truth, why are we so upset about political violence and political chicanery? It seems to make some reasonable sense, right? So control of the government is up for grads every election cycle. The threat of electoral defeat feels existential. If those are the stakes, political chicanery and violence appear to be quite rational. Now I'm gonna give a partial answer to why I think we should be very reluctant to uh, engage in that sort of political violence, um, in large part because I think a lot of our uh, stories and narratives that we tell ourselves is not as much of the truth as we think it is. So this is the idea of fighting phantoms. So this is a slide I showed you earlier, but I sort of glossed over this bit. So Washington makes another claim. He doesn't just say, you know, factionalism is bad for these reasons. He says that it makes us deluded, right? That it yields to ill-founded jealousies and false alarms. This is actually kind of a big deal because if factionalism makes us just more accurate at understanding the truth about the other side, then I don't know that we should be that concerned about it. Is Washington right? Like, do we, as we become factional, do we become deluded and, and develop ill-founded jealousies, false alarms, those sorts of things? Well, there is a robust literature on this and a rapidly expanding literature on this phenomenon called false polarization. So I'll just give a couple examples that I, I find particularly interesting. So, so in this study, this is sort of a, an OG study in this, in this context. This is a study from PSBB in 2000. So um, this study looks at the extent to which you think government should provide support for individuals who are having hardship due to their own failings, right? There's another condition in the study that's like they're, they're having hardship through no fault of their own. Let's just set that aside for now. So, so for example, to what degree do you think the government should provide support for people who lost their job because they're lazy? Support for people who got a venereal disease because they were sexually promiscuous. That's what, that's what they're asking here. Now, I find this interesting. So, so over here on the left, we have self-reports. That is on this scale from like no support at all to an extremely high amount of support, you find the effect that you would expect to find. Liberals are a little bit more bleeding heart about these things than conservative are. This is a statistically reliable difference. It looks to be a meaningful difference of about 1.2 scale points on this 11 point scale. But, but again, what that means is that is that if you have one argument that when people are are respond when people are responsible for their own failings, that's their problem, versus even when people are are at least partial responsibility for their own shortcomings or their own circumstances, government should still look out for them anyway. That's part of the social contract. You find that there are two parties, and the parties on average disagree about where to draw that line. Now, let's look at perceptions from the out party. That is, that is, we'll look first at what do uh, conservatives think liberals will say. Now, this is what they actually said. What do conservatives think? What do conservatives think liberals will say? What do liberals think conservatives will say? And what you see here is this small difference or modest size difference becomes humongous, right? That is, conservatives think that liberals are like uh, almost eight on this scale in terms of how much assistance. Liberals think that conservatives are way toward the bottom of this scale. And you can do something that I'm tentatively calling a distortion ratio. That is, how much actual difference is there? versus how much stereotyped difference is there? And in this study, the, the distortion ratio is four. 
right? That is, there's a meaningful difference here, but we think it is four times larger, by, by our stereotypes, it is four times larger than the reality. Now, let me just editorialize here a moment and say, I believe democracy requires that we don't have complete agreement. And I don't think anybody knows, like nobody has, has even theorists haven't even really developed what is the optimal amount of disagreement for sort of moral issues between two parties in a democracy. You, you know, infinite difference would be bad, but infinite agreement is bad too. That's a one party state. It is possible that the amount of disagreement we have is like optimal. Like that's a debate that you want your society to have, but, but we perceive it to be something that is just a colossal unbridgeable uh, bridge, unbridgeable divide. I'll just give a couple examples. This one is uh, dehumanization. This is from Sam, uh, Samantha Moore Berg and colleagues. This is how much do people uh, dehumanize members of their own party versus another party? So if you look at this, where like this is the sort of ascent of man, ascent of human measure, this is most human, this is most dehumanized here. Basically, when people, uh, there's no moderation by party here. So when Republicans, Democrats think of members of their own party, they think they're mostly human. They don't dehumanize them very much. When they think of the other party, they dehumanize them quite a bit, right? That is a meaningful, big and almost certainly important difference between the two parties, right? I am not trivializing any of that. You can also look at perceptions. That is, to what degree, if you're a Democrat, do you think Republicans dehumanize other Republicans? That's 10.5. To what degree do, do you think Republicans dehumanize Democrats, people like you? And here again, you can calculate a distortion ratio. And what you can see is that there is a meaningful difference. I think it is big and important. It is nowhere close to what exists in our head. And like I said, Democrats, Republicans, this is, I collapsed across them because it didn't make any difference. So yes, there's a meaningful difference here, but the extent to which they think we are animals is grossly disproportionate with the extent to which they actually think we are animals. Let me get to some of our own work. This is work from our lab, collaborative with Amy Gordon, uh, Maria Luciani, and Catherine Garten. We looked at um, Shalom Schwartz's basic human values. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, um, with the uh, cultural psychology literature, but but this Shalom Schwartz, I think, is is the most famous person in the space who's tried to art, who's tried to develop some taxonomy of what basic human values are. He says these values are valued everywhere. These are things that everybody wants. There's some variation that's interesting and predictable, but these are things that everybody wants. We want some level of power, achievement, hedonism that is like a pleasurable life, stimulation, uh, self direction, universalism, benevolence, tradition, conformity, and security. Now, look, I picked these images and you won't be surprised, like I picked the equal sign, but, but basically it's fair to predict that, that Democrats care more about universalism than Republicans do, or tradition. It's fair to predict that uh, Republicans care about tradition than uh, Democrats do. But my question is a little bit different from that. My question is like, if you take this overall constellation of values, like we value these things more than these other things, are Democrats and Republicans pretty similar, pretty dissimilar? Um, and and you can, in, if you want to do that, the way to do that is, is through a profile correlation. So let me just show you here. This is the truth. That is, we, we recruited a large sample of Democrats. Um, and I just plotted this from the thing that they value the least. They still value it, you know, four, um, to the thing they value the most, which is benevolence. And, and, and here's what you see. Now, I'm going to plot this for Republicans too. Before I do this, I'd love to, I'd love to have, have people vote. I can't see very many of you, unfortunately, but, but I'm curious what your prediction would be. Like, is the prediction that basically the two sides agree and that the correlation between what Democrats value, their profile, and what Republicans value is like, I don't know, a huge positive correlation, like 0.5 or bigger? Is it that basically the information that, that one side values is unrelated and that you'd get a correlation of something like zero? Or is it that they really value different things and therefore you get a negative correlation, like let's say a large negative correlation of point five, negative 0.5 or larger? I guess because it's not very many of you that I can see, see and I sort of gave it away. Julia, did you just mute yourself? What's that? No, I unmuted myself because I had a question. Yes, please. Um, so I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to play your game uh, and answer the question. And what I'm wondering about is, is part of the, is part of the sort of perceived difference that people interpret these things differently, right? So like, you know, when Republicans look at security, they're imagining yeah. uh -huh. like military security. And when, you know, Democrats look at security, they're imagining like, you know, like security from like sexual harassment or something, yeah. right? Uh, and, and is that actually like, am I guessing your story right? Or is there a totally different no, no, story that, coming up? I'm actually, I'm actually not going that direction, but I, be, but I believe that to be a crucial thing for us to address in this line of work. Um, so, so we give them definite, we give them definitions, 
but I still think there's room for interpretation. So, so it could be that, you know, fairness means, I mean, we know this, right? So fair, is fairness one of these? I don't think it is. Um, but you're right, security or, or achievement might mean very different things to the two sides. So, so that could be part of the story. And I, based on the data that we have, I can't address it, but I'm planning to, because I, I agree that this is an issue. So there are various ways we could do this. One of them we could, um, we could ask, so this wouldn't, um, this is sort of a pilot test way of doing this. Maybe this is what we should do next is just ask a big sample of Democrats and a big sample of Republicans to define these terms for us and then give it to an independent sample and try, have them try to guess. And I don't know, it'd be interesting to see, can they tell who the Democrats and Republicans are? And that would be consistent with the definitional difference. Um, we could also um, force them to define or have participants define in advance, like what these things mean, then use those differences for all the ways I'm about to show you that we assess these things. But, but long story short, is, it is an intriguing possibility that we can't uh, address empirically at this point. But anyway, I'll just give you the answer. It is a robust positive correlation. It is a positive correlation of 0.54. So it is true that, de that Republicans care more about tradition than Democrats do. Democrats care more about, I don't know, universalism than Republicans do. But, but I think it's fair to say that that's a focus on the trees rather than the forest. And if you focus on the forest, a positive correlation of 0.54 is actually a pretty significant, uh, a pretty large positive correlation. So we can also contrast this with people's stereotypes. So, so let me just reproduce here. So these are Democrats projections, that is Democrats values and what they think Republicans want. This line here is just a reproduction of the Democratic line from the less left side. Well, okay, so so this is this is what Democrats actually believe. That's over here. This is what Republicans actually believe. What do Democrats think Republicans actually believe? Heroically, even though the reality is that there is a strong positive correlation between what Democrats and Republicans actually value, somehow Democrats are convinced that Republicans value literally the exact opposite, negative 0.7. And Republicans basically show the same story. It's negative 0.6. I'm not going to make anything of whether these effects are different sizes. I just want to say large positive correlation when we think about what the two sides actually value, truly large negative correlations when they have to project what the other side thinks they value, or what we think the other side values, right? So somehow heroically, we have like tons of stuff in common and we somehow think we have not only nothing in common, but anti everything in common. And by the way, I, am, are we surprised when the Pew Research Center looks and says, you know, only about one in five Trump and Biden supporters say they share the same core American values, right? Like you see these things, these things are consequential, right? If you think the other side doesn't even share your same basic values, of course you would try to make sure that they don't end up in power. Okay, delusion and hatred. So a couple other findings from our, uh, from our study. Actual value divergence with opposing partisans, that is the, like my own profile and uh, the average, say Republicans profile is unrelated to political hatred. It's a very small correlation, right? So basically the degree to which I have things in common or don't have values in common or not in common is almost unrelated to uh, how much I hate them, but, perceived or false divergence, that is my false projection of how much I differ from them, is strongly related to hatred for them. Okay, let me just revisit this. This is a slide I showed you earlier. This is Solnit's um, on not meeting Nazis halfway. She's talking in general about Trump supporters, not just Charlottesville people. These pieces, these New York Times pieces, treated Trump supporters as both an exotic species and people it was our job to understand. She's saying, don't do that. Stop trying to understand them. Appeasement didn't work in the 1930s and it won't work now. I think this is a dangerous mentality for partisans to hold for the reasons that I just showed you. End of, or summary of point four or part four. We have extremely inaccurate perceptions of opposing partisans, policy preferences, views about us and values. This literature is now large, literally just in the last couple of years, there's been, I think like 30 or 40 new studies on this. Um, and uh, the distortions are reliably large. And so far as I can tell, we're starting a meta-analysis of this. I I'm reasonably sure that this, is, uh, that this is not a literature that has a large uh, file drawer problem. Um, and then distortions, that is these false perceptions, predict hatred much more strongly than accuracy does. Like really understanding what the other side believes doesn't really predict hatred. Believing that we know and that they're nothing like us, that predicts our hatred. I'll stop here. I think I see another uh, chat. Uh, we have some of this. I'm from studies of SDO, for instance. Yes, that's right. Anything else that anybody wants to watch? I'm through like 90% here. I have a brief sections five and six, but I'm through most of the content. Anybody want to chime in here or should I plow through the last of it and then we'll have broader discussion? Yeah, go ahead, Julia. 
So this is really interesting. It's making me think about, you know, sort of the literature on false polarization, right? And sort of this yeah. idea that people are more, people think the sides to be further apart than they really are. That's right. sort of been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, you're adding sort of all these other things that we're wrong about, yeah. right? So, oh. I, I, yeah, I view our study as just one more false polarization study. I, I think it's relevant because it's in the domain of values. And we like to think that it's really our values that are most important. But I agree. I mean, it's, it's, we are, this study is one of several dozen false polarization studies. For me, I have felt pretty hopeless about our political situation, except for this. I feel like well, the biggest. I, I, I didn't. I didn't mean that to say that like this is just another false polarization oh, no. <laughs> What I meant to say was this opens up this whole other domain of like what are all the things that yeah. we think we know that yeah. we don't actually know, right? Totally. So the magnitude of the difference is the old false polarization stuff, and you're talking about like the types of things that people care about. Yeah. Uh, the New York Times ran this, like, I think fairly stupid thing uh, right after the election where you had to guess, they just had like pictures of the insides of people's fridges and you had I to guess that. whether this was a Republican or yeah. a Democratic yeah. fridge. And obviously you couldn't tell who was a Republican or Democratic fridge, but people thought they could. Yeah. Uh, huh. But yeah. like, what are all the things that we think we can guess that yeah. we think we have yeah. stereotypes about that we're just dead wrong about? Yeah. And no, I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't think you were you were uh, diminishing the, the project. I mean, my view is that this is just one in what is becoming basically a, a wall of evidence that we are wrong in a big way. We're not like, eh, we're basically the same in terms of our values, but we underestimate it. It's like we're basically the same in terms of our values and somehow believe we are literally the opposite of that. And so I find our, our study to be a, a neat one, but I don't think it's anything other than contributing to this, to this truth, truism, that, that we are fighting phantoms, which is the title of the talk. And, and, I, and I just wanna underscore that I have felt, like I was saying earlier, a little bit discouraged about the state of our politics. And it's like, well, you know, maybe an external threat will bring us together. But of course, you know, 9-11 did that for like 45 minutes. Like maybe when China gets to Omaha, we'll start to come together. Or like I went through all of the classic social psychology about what, or maybe we need a common external threat, right? But I went through all of that stuff and basically felt hopeless. I was like, I don't, or, you know, there, there is no voice that can speak to both sides. It is this. This is the finding that gives me hope. Because to the degree that we can actually get through to people and say, Yes, some of those politicians are really bad, and they are, but, but it is Democrats and it is Republicans. And if you look at the actual issues, if you look at the ideologies, if you look at the, the policy preferences, if you look at the values, you think you are fighting people on the other side who are horrifying evildoers. They're a whole lot like us. Jen, do you want to chime in? Eli, this is such fascinating work. And um, so a comment and a question. Um, quick comment is that I hope you broaden to studying this more internationally because uh, one of the key differences, I think, when you compare, for example, us to many European countries is that they've seen democracies die, mm. whereas we haven't. And so they seem to be much more receptive to lots of citizens' assemblies, huh. uh, more receptive to deliberative democracy participation, mm -hmm. whereas we're like, what could go wrong? <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. um, and this is all we've ever known. Yeah. Um, you know, but certainly Germans, um, you know, they've seen a lot change. They have. And yeah. um, so, uh, so I hope you expand it. And then I, I have an idea for how you might reconcile this seeming similarity when it comes down to core values with then what we see in discourse. And I think um, a missing ingredient is, is actually self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and it's that I think that I have, this is gonna sound ridiculous, you know, reasoning from introspection. But I notice, for example, when I talk to our Trump voting neighbor, that I act in more liberal leaning, 
um, ways. And um, I feel like compelled to embody the image I think he has of me. Mm. <laughs> and, mm. and as you know, there's half a century of studies on how profound self-fulfilling prophecy is. Mm. And so, um, and this might sound very Goffman-esque, but I really think there is something to the idea of um, when we're actually interacting, we ourselves may exaggerate these differences. Mm. And, um, and so uh, you've been downplaying uh, your expertise here and said, I'm really, I'm a relationship researcher coming into this and all that. But in a way, you have an advantage in that you understand self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think that that is one of the pieces that it can explain the, um, the seeming puzzle mm -hmm. of our shared similarity and then how we come away saying like, that guy is totally different from me because that guy probably acted in a more extreme version of themselves. <laughs> Just like study after study where the student who was expected to behave as an underperformer then underperformed. Um, so that's my idea. And I, as I you know, it, I have to leave for parents weekend at my daughter's school. So I'm not stopping yeah. and storming I, off. I, I do a very, very quick, I, I find that totally intriguing. And, and weirdly in the relationship space, uh, like like marriage research, um, the term that they use when like you and I are having a little bit of a fight and then like I get more engulfed in my side and you get more engulfed in yours and I get more engulfed in mine is, is literally called polarization. That's what they call it, I think, without any realization that they're talking about something that also exists in the world of politics. Um, so this is an interesting idea that we sort of are pushing people to um, basically act in accord with what they know they're supposed to do. I, I love that. Thank you right. and see you later. Um, Zoe, why don't I take one one from you and then I'll, I'll do my last couple of slides and then I'll open it up more broadly. Uh, one question I had was our ability to interpret our own values and, and correlate, bring, um, make political or policy decisions in relationship to our own values. And so maybe this is where you're going in your next step, but is the solution also to be have a better understanding of how our values are translated into policy there, therefore we can recognize um, the source of differences not being value-based? Um. No, but I, I'm, uh, that is totally fascinating. Um, it gets to a place where I'm really pessimistic, not in like a horrified way. I'm pessimistic in a horrified way about the state of our politics. Like I, I really feel like we are in a, in a fragile moment for our nation. Um, but I'm skeptical about what is reasonable to ask of a citizen. Now, I just built this whole talk around, and this I am going to get to in a little bit, I'm going to conclude where I started, which is like the individual citizen has a lot of responsibility. I, um, in accord with the, the political theory that I've been reading about in the last few years, I'm on board with this idea that we need parties, that, that, that there, is no, there is no individual citizen who has the time and the, the, the motivation, but literally the wherewithal to think critically about all of the available issues and weigh them against one another. I mean, I think Jen's gone, but this is sort of a, a judgment and decision-making problem. Um, and most people, thank God, are not that interested. Like, I, I don't think it's that good that all, so many of us are so obsessively interested in this stuff. So I am not that optimistic that we can train people to be more tuned in to how their values translate into policies. And in part, this is going back to, I don't know whether the, this group is familiar with the, the classic Nisbet and Wilson paper about telling more than you can know. But to some degree, um, you know, we favor a policy. And then when we go to our ideology, we're kind of answering the why question that Nisbet and Wilson tell us we probably can't do well. That is, I favor gay marriage. And then I have a story that I tell myself about why I favor gay marriage, but, but it very plausibly is not what's actually driving support for those things. So all of this is to say that, that I think in principle, Zoe, it would be very cool to get people to be more tuned in to what it is that they value, what the trade-offs are involved in various policies, and then to link them, link their values more directly to their policies. I believe that to be not low hanging fruit. I think that is something that doing that at the level of a 330 million person country is a big, a big lift.
Okay, I'm gonna finish this. The, I have parts five and six, they're both short. Oh yeah, so anyway, these, these findings that I showed you, the false polarization findings, I think are a partial answer to let's not get violent yet. Like these, the uh, power hangs in the balance and we uh, have these existential narratives that we're telling, but maybe we're not as right as we think, or maybe the narrative that we have is right, but it is just one of many right narratives and that, that other people have different narratives. And from those perspectives, uh, the world makes sense in a different way. And that in our narrative, if we view it in isolation, we have caricatured and mischaracterized the other side. Okay, I've argued that, um, that we are a dumpster fire. Uh, our political system right now is a dumpster fire because we the people are failing. There are very good alternative explanations, at least one of which has already come up. Um, this terrific book uh, basically blames Newt Gingrich, but you could generally blame political elites. I'm happy to throw Donald Trump into the, the category of people who are just immensely divisive. Um, you could maybe talk about social media. I already said a little bit about this, but there's no question in my mind that social media has radically um, expanded the pace at which political hatred um, goes viral, so to speak. Um, and then there are all sorts of structural solutions that people have, like we've got gerrymandered districts, um, we've got very archaic voting systems, like why not rank choice voting? There are all sorts of solutions that we have that I think other people would say, this is where we should focus our attention. But for me, those are just mediators, right? Those are just proximal causes because the distal cause is still us. That's what it means to have a government of and by the people, right? So why is it that somebody like a Newt Gingrich or a Donald Trump wins? Well, we kind of know the answer, right? So this paper shows that in, in competitive house districts, almost nobody would lose the election. Almost nobody running for uh, the House of Representatives would lose the election by being anti-democratic by like trying to suppress the vote on the other side or denying civil liberties to the other side. We just don't punish people on our side for doing that very much. They estimate that we punish about 3.5 percentage points, but very few elections are decided by that small amount. Why is it that social media is such a cesspool of political hatred? Because we like it, right? This is a, a PNAS paper from earlier this year. Um, this, this paper basically shows, you know what we love? We love retweeting and engaging with things that talk about how evil the other side is. Like Facebook and Twitter, they have warped incentives, but only because we're warped. They just want us to stay engaged. It's not their fault that, I mean, you could argue that they have some responsibility too, and I think they do, but it's not primarily their fault that what gets us engaged is hatred. Or how about these restructuring sorts of things? Like this is a a terrific new book by Lee Druckmann, uh, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop. He has all sorts of structural solutions, but he's as aware as everybody that we're not likely to get any of these solutions. And the main reason why is because of the extremity of the partisanship. So for me, the conclusion here is like, there's not that many options that we confront. Um, there are more than these, like civil war is one, but here's a few. Electoral victory, maybe one side will finally win the, the marketplace of ideas and that will, you know, re, that'll just basically reshuffle the, the political system. I used to be optimistic that this was gonna happen and that it was gonna be Democrats do basically the demographic shifts. I'm no longer optimistic about that. Second is undemocratic conquest. I think um, both sides, again, I think Republicans are worse, but I think both sides are starting to engage in these behaviors. But what about like getting better? Like what about um, stopping distorting reality in such an extreme way to make the other side seem so incomprehensible to us? They're much more comprehensible than we think. Um, so this is a, um, there's a lot of words for this. To, um, Deliberative democracy, uh, Rosenblum here talks about trial by discussion. And, and this basically, Julia, I'm grateful to you, like you and your lab have been doing, I think a lot of the work to try to find out, well, how is it that we can start to be able to engage uh, with ideas that are on the other side? And it is, it is harder to do than I wish it were. All right, um, the cavalry is not coming. Uh, we might think that there's some solution to our problem that somebody else is going to fix. I don't think that's true. And I'm persuaded by Louis Brandeis, who says that the most important political office is that of the private citizen. And now this is me. This is related to an op-ed I'm preparing, which is that democracy asks that we fight fiercely, not only for our ideals and policy preferences. For sure, we should do that. I'm not pushing for centrism. I'm not pu pushing for compromise necessarily. I'm pushing that people should fight fiercely, but that we should fight also against sectarianism-induced blindness. It has many negative consequences, not least of which is it's really hard to meet our own political goals when we are so deluded about what the other side is trying to achieve. All right, that's all I got. Can I open it up more broadly to uh, a discussion here?
Julia, are you monitoring the chat? I see three things in there. Anything you want to highlight? Uh, there was a question about evidence for uh, the benefits of sort of non-political discussion for overcoming polarization. And I know one David Brookman paper, um, but I'm wondering if you know of anything else. Yeah. Oh, are you talking about this? The um, Yes, where... Yes, that's, I definitely know that paper. Um, and in fact, aren't you guys replicating it? Like, don't you guys have related work? Did I make that up? So we've never, we don't do a sort of non-political discussion. So okay. we, we try to have people discuss issues that they okay. strongly disagree about that are sort of political issues and intervene to make those discussions better. He basically, I believe they have mm -hmm. uh, Democrats and Republicans talking about explicitly non-political things. Uh, so I'm forgetting. Uh, so I know there's stuff about like, you know, trans rights people come to the door. This was an earlier paper, I think, right? That's and, an and it's like, paper, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know who's, I'm sorry, you know who's, I think it's Kurt Gray's lab that has been doing some research replicating mm. this stuff. Um, so the, there does seem to be a line of research on if you can humanize the other side, right? That, that is, I think what, if I remember correctly, what, what um, Cal and Brockman have done. It's like, if you, can, if you can humanize the other side, like you're no longer dealing with like the trans boogeyman, but you're actually talking to an actual trans person. It's like, you know what? They're not as weird and different as I feared they would be, or as I assumed they would be. And, and those sorts of interactions do seem to be effective. Again, these aren't huge effects, but those do seem to be effective and are very consistent with the, the worldview that I'm um, advocating for here. But also Julia, I, I think you're, like the last several years of uh, some of the re research you've done in the last few years has done this too. I think that's different from whether people put their political identity on signs, like the, whether politicians do that. I think this is I, like my explanation for those effects is if you can humanize the boogeyman, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see, I'm definitely like trying to monitor the chat in real time. Um, if you guys have stuff that you want to share that, that you'd like to sort of share verbally, definitely sort of unmute yourself and go ahead, Gabriella. Hello. First of all, thank you so much. It was so interesting. Thank you. Um, thank you. I don't know if you have any thoughts about this. This is just something that's on my mind often. Um, but the, dis the, the distinction between having family with different um, political views and having friends with different political views, I think about it all the time because I have both. Um, and I feel like sometimes with my family, I, and I, I feel like with other people with family with different political views, it's almost easier to say, well, I, I'm close to this issue. I understand that I have family on this issue or that have these issues. I can generalize for this entire population now. Whereas when you have friends and you're choosing to engage in that relationship, mm -hmm. you're more empathetic and you're like, you're actually more mm -hmm. interested and it's more of a grounding than a generalization. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on this. That is a totally, Yes, I've been thinking about this, but, but what you just said is a totally new idea. So, so let me come at it by saying a little bit of what I have been thinking about and then come back to, to your specific idea, which I view as quite new. So the family stuff is, is going to be core to this, this book that I write. And it's sort of like you know, the New York Times, I mentioned you and I are pathetic. I guess we have to keep quoting these liberal rags. Um, but they had the, the angry uncle bot. Does anybody remember this? It was like for a couple of years there, they had like, OK, it's coming up on Thanksgiving and you're going to have these political things. And, and what like why is it so obvious to all of us what that uncle bot is? Because we all get that we're extremely polarized these days, but we get something else too, which is that family matters, right? And, and so one of the ideas for the book is, and actually one of the, we've started a line of research on this, is can we inculcate the idea that America is kind of a family? And there's a lot of leaders, the table of brotherhood, there's a lot of leaders who have talked um, in terms of, of thinking about family. And I'm not gonna go into this because it's too long of a detour, but, but I'm building this a little bit on the work by George Lakoff who talked about um, the implicit family metaphors that, that Republicans and Democrats have. So the, the Republicans, he argues, have this sort of strict father family metaphor for thinking about society where government is basically strict and you know, supposed to punish you if you do wrong. Whereas you know, the Democrats are more likely to have the nurturing parent metaphor for thinking about the role of government and society. I want to incul inculcate this idea of like the struggling family, like, yes, we're having debate. Yes, we're fighting over politics. But in the end, we're a family. And does that is that a particularly useful superordinate category? You've raised an interesting alternative to that, which is it is really our voluntary relationships that are especially effective. Again, this is your hypothesis, I believe, that are especially effective in having us open our minds 
And I don't have strong instincts either way, other than to say there's something new happening in the friend case beyond the family case. So the family case is like you're born into it and you're kind of stuck with it. The friend case is we're still friends, even though we have this level of disagreement. And so there might be like a threshold difference such that you've sort of cut off. If you're somebody who is going to cut off people, you've already cut them off. Or if people were beyond the pale, you would have already cut them off. And so now you're dealing with a subset of either really open-minded people who are willing to be friends with somebody on the other side or people whose friends aren't that extreme in the first place. And so it may be, if this effect actually emerges, it may be due to the idea that, that friends are particularly persuasive, but it might also be that, um, that we've persevered with this subset of friends who are different from us and therefore we're more open-minded. I find all of that super interesting and to my knowledge, totally unstudied. I think we have uh, two I can minutes. I build on that a little bit. I think that's also really, really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I think the order of events matters, right? So I've read a ton of stuff, you know, since the, like the Trump years, right? Where yeah. friendships have gotten destroyed yeah. by people ending up on opposite sides who never realized that they would have different politics before, right? So like, as Eli said, there's, there's sort of one version where you don't become friends with the person in the first place because they're too different or somewhere along the way you decide that their politics are intolerable to you and you quit. Yeah. Uh, the hardest one is when you have been friends for a long time mm -hmm. and this new political sort of set of beliefs is a complete surprise to you, right? And there's something about the expectation, this is where I think friends and family are sort of in the same category and different than strangers. Right, where you sort of think the, the people around me who I love and who I'm close with ought to be reasonable. Like I expect them to be, you know, mm. sensible, wonderful, caring, you know, compassionate people. And how can they possibly act like this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whereas those people over there, well, I get that they're weird. Mm. So this is exactly what I would expect from people like mm. that. Right. Um, and I think. You know, it's something that I've actually tried studying and it's super, super hard because it's like hard to randomly assign people to having different relationships, <laughs> but it's, right. it, it, it just, it's just fascinating. Um, just a couple quick riffs on that. I see that we're almost out of time, but um, one riff, I doubt this would work, but do you, you may know that in the relationships or social psych space, there are these like fast friends paradigms. Do you know these where people, I know that's not family, but if you think it's something that that um, like they're able to cultivate a reasonable sense of closeness pretty quickly. So I don't know if that would be sufficient, um, but you also raise an interesting issue. The, the reason why I, one reason why I think that's as complicated as it is aside from this random assignment issue is that you should have strong effects pointing in opposite directions, right? Like on the one hand, it should be like, well, we really love each other. We've got all this history together. I should be able to forbear. I should be able to excuse or tolerate your difference in a way that a stranger I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with a stranger to forgive. I'd be like, you're done, I'm done with you. But at the same time, the level of betrayal should feel almost more serious if it's happening close to us. So it's almost like you should expect to get this weird divergence on dependent variables such that, such that I'm more angry with somebody when they're close to me rather than distant from me, but I'm more willing to endure and fight to, to understand and to, to sustain the relationship if they're close. And that's not that common that you get this sort of divergence on variables like that. I don't want to overstay my welcome, so I, I should probably say farewell. Thank you guys very much for having me. Thank you, Julia, for inviting me. Thank you, Eli. That was wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, and we will see you uh, for the next uh, talk in the series that will be announced shortly. Bye, all.